Ladies and gentlemen, it is your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs and Illustration here, and today I'm excited to talk to you about a slightly lesser known Ocean Liner from history. We of course all know the story of Olympic and her sister Britannic, but there was of course a third Olympic class sister, built after Olympic and before Britannic. This ship was called Titanic, and although her story has largely been relegated to the history books today, she had a career that was just as fascinating as that of Olympic. It's a brilliant story, even if she couldn't quite escape her sister's shadow. The Olympic class were designed from the outset as a trio of ships, as it was obvious that three massive steamers would be required to maintain a regular weekly schedule across the Atlantic. Titanic and Olympic were built side by side at Harland and Wolfe, and it was Olympic which was completed first and sailed on her maiden voyage in June 1911. Titanic's completion was delayed thanks to a couple of Olympic's mishaps, including the collision with the British cruiser Hawk, but in April 1912 the ship was finished and ready for her maiden voyage. White Starline gave Titanic the full PR treatment, and she was billed as both the largest and safest vessel afloat. Just as Olympic had before her, Titanic departed Southampton on April 10th, 1912, although with maybe less fanfare than had been afforded her sister. Even this wasn't without incident, however. As she sailed past, Titanic's wake drew in the steamer New York, and a collision was only narrowly averted. Some took this as an ill omen, and indeed it was the first of many similar misfortunes that would haunt Titanic for her entire career. The ship's maiden voyage went as planned, save for one incident on the night of the 14th, which almost ended in disaster. It was a moonless night and very still, which made it extremely difficult for the ship's lookouts to scan the water for icebergs. Approaching midnight, Titanic was at near full speed when her lookouts and bridge crew spotted a dark shape ahead. It was the ship's first officer whose actions prevented a collision, a Mr. William Murdoch, who ordered the helm swung over and the engines stopped. A few minutes later there was a deep rumbling as Titanic's starboard bow hit and glanced off the iceberg, and the ship stopped dead in the water. Her skipper, a Captain Edward Smith, one of the White Star's veteran COs, conducted a damage assessment and found that the impact was only slight, and the ship's hull had only been grazed. After a half hour, steam was put back on and the ship resumed her voyage. It's been thought that if Murdoch had delayed a few more moments, the collision could have been much more serious. On Wednesday, April 17th, 1912, Titanic arrived safely in New York for the first time, although with a fairly obvious scratch along her starboard bow, which attracted much attention. Titanic and Olympic had successful seasons in 1912 and 1913, and there was a third sister on the way, Britannic. In 1913, Olympic went for a refit, which saw her receive a Parisian cafe like her younger sister had, and on completion she was actually bigger than Titanic. But instead of running the two sisters against one another, White Star Line simply referred to both of them as the biggest ships in the world. In February 1914, Britannic was completed and introduced to the lineup, and the Olympic class trio was at last fully operational. The director of the White Star Line, Bruce Ismay, could see his ultimate shipbuilding dream play out. The company recorded massive profits, and the enormous Britannic, which featured more luxurious spaces than Olympic and Titanic, was hugely popular. Sadly, however, world events were to intercede, and this would be the only time the Olympic class trio would sail together as conceived by Ismay and Co. back in 1909. The outbreak of the First World War was a disaster for the Atlantic shipping trade, as it was for the rest of the world in general. And initially, the Olympic class trio was laid up before briefly resuming voyages with greyed out superstructures. Finally, in 1915, the three were properly mothballed while the White Star Line discussed agreements with the Admiralty. First, Olympic and Titanic were converted to use as troop ships. Titanic was placed under the command of Captain Charles Bartlett. She received a trio of 4.7 inch guns with a forward pair firing both port and starboard on the forecastle and one centrally mounted gun at the stern. Her lifeboat capacity and that of her sisters was boosted with radial davits installed along the boat deck bulwark and 10 additional 30 foot boats with collapsibles placed underneath. Her funnels were blackened and windows and promenades along D, C, B and A deck were blocked out to prevent light spillage. 
Olympic and Titanic were predominantly tasked with ferrying troops to the Dardanelles campaign and operated between Liverpool and Mudros, but by late 1915, casualties in Gallipoli had become so severe that there was a desperate need for hospital ships. Britannic, which was by then midway through conversion into a troop ship, was instead converted into a hospital ship, repainted white and placed under the command of Captain Herbert Haddock. Titanic followed suit in January 1916 and was recalled to Belfast for conversion. She returned to service in her all-white guise as the HMHS Titanic in mid-February of that year. Photographs from around this period show Titanic and Olympic both anchored facing each other in Woodrow's Harbour. Titanic's time as a hospital ship was marred with a number of small collisions and incidents, but ultimately she carried thousands in relative safety. In November 1916, Britannic struck a mine off the island of Kia and began to sink. Tragically, the ship could not be beached in time and there was a struggle on board to lower the ship's boats from their well and davits against a serious list. Britannic sank in under an hour and some 564 crew, nurses and medical personnel perished. Titanic was again called back to Belfast for conversion work as the tempo of the war shifted and she would again return to the Atlantic Ocean. 1917 was a crucial year for the Allied powers. The United States joined the war in April of 1917, and Titanic, along with Olympic, became tasked with crossing the Atlantic to ferry troops to the Western Front. To this end, Titanic received a complex dazzle paint scheme to disorient enemy submarines, as well as four BL 6-inch guns. Interestingly, however, Olympic received an additional pair in her forward well deck, which Titanic did not. Titanic's primary weapon during this time, however, was her speed, and she used this well, often sailing in excess of 20 knots. While Olympic encountered a number of German submarines during the war, Titanic did not. A periscope was thought spotted by the crew in late August 1917, although no torpedoes were reported, and Titanic escaped by sailing away in a zigzag. In May 1918, Olympic famously ran down and sank the German submarine U-103, earning the ship further accolades and solidifying her nickname, the Old Reliable. Titanic did have one shot at glory, although this too evaded her grasp. In July 1918, distress rockets were spotted fired off on the horizon, and an investigation revealed these to be fired from the small Cunard liner Carpathia, which had been torpedoed and was sinking fast. Titanic, which was empty of troops, approached to render assistance. However, the destroyer HMS Snowdrop had arrived on scene and signaled to Titanic with flags that the enemy submarine was still at large and she should depart. Titanic made steam, sailed away and arrived safely in Liverpool. In October 1918, Titanic was involved in a collision with a collier and her stem was fractured, causing her forepeak to take on water. This necessitated the ship be taken from service back to Belfast for repairs. So it was that on Armistice Day in November 1918, while Olympic was triumphantly moored in New York Harbour after her 28th trooping voyage, Titanic was moored at the Harland & Wolf fitting out wharf. It was something of an ignominious end for the mighty ship's wartime service, although she still had a role to play. Along with Olympic, Titanic began repatriating Canadian troops and did so through 1919. She never quite received the same welcome as did the old Reliable, however. Regardless, Titanic had carried as many as 200,000 in safety through war-torn oceans and had travelled hundreds of thousands of miles. The 1920s was a decade of success for the White Star Line. The loss of Britannic had been a blow, but the introduction of RMS Majestic as a running mate to Titanic and Olympic saw the line once more gain the ability to boast of the largest transatlantic trio of liners in the world. While Olympic had her interiors modernised in the Art Deco style, it was decided that a point of difference be made between the sisters and Titanic retained most of her original timber panelling in appearance. Because of this, they began to attract a different kind of customer. Olympic, the modern, younger, glamorous nouveau riche, the Titanic, the established and more traditional old money, and the majestic, the ostentatious and the famous. Titanic's first class amenities had always had an edge over those of Olympic, with many more luxurious first class staterooms on her B deck, and in 1925, an additional pair of suites were added, each with their own private promenade, as the original pair had always been in high demand. 
Olympic received the same ADEX screens as her sister to provide additional enclosed promenade space, as well as additional staterooms on B deck. Crucially though, both sisters' lifeboat capacities were permanently increased. Before the war, it had been thought by some that Board of Trade regulations had lagged somewhat behind the size of passenger ships and the volume of their passengers. However, the loss of ships during the First World War demonstrated the need for enough boats on board for all passengers and crew. Titanic and Olympic's boat deck bulwarks were cut away, and their boat decks lined with lifeboats for the rest of their careers. As the 1920s wore on, fortunes slowly began to shift, and the passenger numbers dropped. While Majestic was still a favourite, and Olympic was a close second, it was Titanic that suffered most. While Olympic appeared in a number of period films, Titanic only featured in two. One, a French example, has been lost to time, and the other was a 1928 flop comedy starring Eddie Cantor called A Night to Remember. On top of this, as always, Titanic was involved in a number of minor incidents and collisions, which frequently saw her returning to Belfast for repairs or replacement of propeller blades. Of note, in 1927, Titanic was caught up in an Atlantic storm so severe it smashed in the windows on her bridge and swept one unfortunate crew member to his death from the Monkey Island atop the bridge. The Great Depression only made things worse for the White Star Line, and it became abundantly clear that Olympic and Titanic would struggle to compete against the superliners under construction in Germany, Italy and France. In 1930, Titanic's central turbine casing was found to have a crack in it, and she limped back to Belfast for repair. Once there, however, it was decided that this would be the end of the line for Titanic. She was pulled from service, even though her machinery was still relatively sound. After 18 years at sea, the mighty liner made her final voyage to Rosyth, Scotland, and the Breakers Yard. Olympic would follow suit in 1935, when she too would be scrapped at Jarrow. So there you have it, the fascinating story of a ship that had a, a brilliant, very fascinating career, but could never quite escape living in her older sister's shadow. It's really easy to think of Titanic today, in between all of her incidents and accidents during and after the war, as an unlucky ship. But it's well worth thinking back to the start of her career, way back on her maiden voyage, when she encountered that iceberg late at night. If the crew hadn't taken evasive manoeuvres as soon as they did, it's not implausible to think Titanic could have hit the iceberg. And if she'd hit the iceberg hard enough, it's also not impossible to imagine there could have been some serious damage. Enough to cripple, or maybe even sink her. At that time, a ship being lost on her maiden voyage under such circumstances would have been unheard of. So it's kind of chilling to imagine what could have happened. It's really a shame that Titanic has been relegated to the history books, but she's a firm favourite of mine alongside the Olympic. Tell me what you thought of my video in the comments. I love reading them and I try to reply to as many of them as possible. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again next time.